College Algebra, Chapter 2, Section 6, Operations and Composition. A few de definitions here for operations on functions. If we're given two functions, f and g, then for all values of x, for which both f of x and g of x are defined, the functions f plus g, f minus g, f times g, and f divided by g are defined as follows. So what we're saying here is when you have f plus g of x, what you're doing is you're taking f of x and adding g of x to it. f minus g of x means to take f of x and subtract g of x. f times g of x means to multiply the two functions together. And f over g of x means to divide the two functions. So let's try this out. Let f of x equal x squared plus 1 g of x equal 3x plus 5. We're going to perform these operations. And what you're going to do is you're going to put in the number that they give you for x in f and in g, and then do whatever it tells you to do, whether it's add them, subtract them, multiply, or divide. Pause the recording, see if you can do this, and resume the recording to check your answer. So for a, we take f of 1 and add g of 1 f of 1 is 1 squared plus 1, which is 2. g of 1 is 3 times 1 plus 5, which is 8. 2 plus 8 is 10. For b, we put negative 3 in f, and we get 10. We put negative 3 in g, and we get negative 4, and then we subtract. 10 minus negative 4 is 14. For C, we put F, we put 5 in F, and that gives us 26. We put 5 in G, that gives us 20. 26 times 20 is 520. And then finally for D, we put 0 in F, and we get 1. We put 0 in G, and get 5. And our final answer is 1 fifth. You can also use your graphing calculator to help you verify that what you've done is correct. That's a little involved, but this can help. What you're going to do is you're going to put f is y1 and g is y2. Now don't forget which is which. It's very important and you might want to jot them down. We're not actually going to graph them though. What we're going to do is we're going to put them in as y1 and y2 and then go to the home screen. So you're going to hit second and then mode. You're going to quit and go to the home screen. You're going to bring up y1 and y2. Notice in parentheses next to each is the number that goes in place of x. And then you put a plus, minus, times, or divide, depending on what the instructions are. Now, you're probably wondering, how do I get the y1 and the y2? Okay, what you're going to do to do that is you're going to hit the key that says VARS, V-A-R-S. It's short for variables. It's the key directly to the left of the clear button. When you press that key, you have a menu, and at the top it says VARS, V-A-R-S, and then underneath it says Windows, Zoom, etc. Next to it, it says Y-VARS, Y variables. So you want to hit the right arrow key and highlight Y variables. And the very first item on that menu is function, so you're going to want to hit Enter. And then you'll notice you have a list of Y1, Y2, Y3 choose the one that's appropriate. So for Y1, you're going to go ahead and hit Enter. For Y2, you'd go down to number 2 and hit Enter. And this is a way to double check what you've done. Um, honestly, trying just to do it this way is a lot longer than actually just solving the problem by hand. Here's another example to try. Uh, notice we don't have any numbers to put in. We're just going to be combining the functions. Pause the recording and give this a try, then resume the recording to check your answer. For part A, just put a plus in between the two functions. There's nowhere to combine like terms, no way to combine anything. So your answer is very simply 8x minus 9 plus the square root of 2x minus 1. For part B, you're just going to put 8x minus 9 over the square root of 2x minus 1. Now for C, we need to remember that our denominator is not allowed to equal 0. We also need to remember that what's under a square root must be positive. So or zero. 
So what we need is we need 2x minus 1 to be greater than 0. So solve that inequality, and we find that x must be greater than 1 half, so our domain is from 1 half to infinity. Now we're going to use a graph to evaluate these functions. They give you the x value. You're going to find the y value for that function using the graph, and then perform the indicated operation. Pause to give it a try and resume the recording to check your answer. Okay, for negative 2, when we go, we find negative 2 on the x-axis and go to the blue line, we find that f has a y value of negative 3. However, g of negative 2 does not exist. There is no y value when x is negative 2 for g. So a is undefined. For part b, when you go to 1 on the x-axis and you go up to the blue line, you have a y value of 3. When you go 1 on the x-axis and go up to the red curve, g has a value of 1. So we have 3 times 1, which is 3. For part c, f of 0 is 1. However, g of 0 is 0, which means we have 1 over 0, which is undefined. Now we have something called the difference quotient. Okay. A secant line is a line that goes through two points on a curve. Here in this graph, we have a secant going through points P and Q of the equation y equals f of x. y equals f of x is the blue curve. The horizontal distance between the two points is h. If we were to find the slope of the secant line, it would be f of x plus h, which is the y value for point Q minus f of x, which is the y value for point P, over x plus h, which is the x value for point Q, minus x, which is the x value for point P. Simplifying that, really just the denominator there, the two x's will go away, and you're left with f of x plus h minus f of x over h. This expression is called the difference quotient, and it is very important in the study of calculus. It also gives you the average rate of change of the function f from x to x plus h. The difference quotient is essential in the definition of the derivative of a function, which you will hear a lot about when you take calculus. Uh, the slope of the secant line is the average rate of change. We deal a lot with change in calculus. The derivative is used to find the slope of the tangent line to the graph of a function at a point. And the slope of the tangent line gives you an instantaneous rate of change. So the slope of the secant would give you your average speed from home to school in miles per hour. The slope of the tangent line would give you your exact speed at any given second in the trip. The derivative is found by letting h approach zero in the difference quotient. So for example, the slope of the secant line approaches the slope of the tangent line as h gets close to zero. You will learn a lot about this in calculus. Now to find the difference quotient, all you need to do is to take the function and just put it in place, in its place in the difference quotient. So we're going to find the difference quotient and simplify. We're going to work through this together. First of all, we've got the difference quotient. And then in the next step, we have put x plus h in place of x in the first part of the equation, and then you've just got f of x, it's all over h. And then we multiplied out the x plus h squared, and we removed the, um, the parentheses, we distributed a little bit. So now we've got 2 times x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus 3x minus 3h minus 2x squared plus 3x. You might already be able to see where this is going. Okay, we multiplied through by the 2. Now we're going to combine like terms. And you'll notice the 2x squareds go away. And the 3x's go away. So we're left with 4xh plus 2h squared minus 3h. Notice that there's an h in all of these, so we can factor out the h. 
and then the h will cancel and leave us with 4x plus 2h minus 3. And that is our difference quotient. Now the last thing we're going to talk about in this section is the composition of functions. If f and g are functions, then the composite function or composition of g and f is g of f of x, the little o represents of, or another way of writing it is g, and then f would be in the parentheses, and then x all the way on the inside. And this is true for all x in the domain of f, such that f of x is in the domain of g. And that sounds a little complicated, but what that means is that the x values have to, first of all, be valid for the function f, for the inside function, and then the results of the inside function have to be valid for the domain of g, the outside function. Let's look at an application here. Suppose an oil well off the California coast is leaking. The leak spreads in a circular layer of, over the water. And the area of the circle is pi r squared. At any time t in minutes, the radius increases by 5 feet every minute. So the radius of the circle of the oil slick is 5 t. 5 feet times however much time has gone by. We're going to express the area as a function of time using the substitution. So what we're going to do, it's going to be a of r of t. r of t is 5t, so we're going to do a of 5t. That means we're going to replace r with 5t. So we get pi times 5t squared, or 25 pi t squared. Okay, let's look at another example. We've got the f of x is 2x minus 1 and g of x is 4 over x minus 1. We're going to find f of g of 2 and g of f of negative 3. Now I've already set up the problem a little bit on a and b. See if you can finish the problem. Pause, pause the recording, give it a try, and resume the recording to see how you did. Okay, so we have f of g of 2, which means f of g of 2. In other words, we're going to do g of 2, and then that answer is going to be placed into f in place of x. So g of 2 is 4. So now we need to find f of 4. And we put 4 in place of x and we get 7. So the answer for a is 7. For b we're going to start with f and put negative 3 in for x in f and then our answer for that is going to go into function g. So when we put negative 3 into f of x, we get negative 7. And then we're going to put negative 7 into g, we get 4 over negative 8, which is negative 1 half. Okay, we're going to do the same thing here. This time, though, no numbers. We're going to actually compose the functions themselves. And again, I've given you a little bit of a head start. See if you can complete these problems. Pause the recording to try it, and resume the recording to check your answer. All right, for A, we have g of f of x. Now, I like rewriting it like they do here with the brackets, g of f in the brackets of x, because that reminds me to replace f of x with what f of x actually is, which is 4x plus 1. And that reminds me that I am going to take that whole thing and stick it in place of the x, in fact both x's, in the function g. So I'm going to have 2 times 4x plus 1 squared plus 5 times 4x plus 1. Now we just did the hard part. If we've get, gotten that far, the rest, we just need to do some algebra. We need to square the 4x plus 1 and we're going to need to distribute. So there we've squared it and distribute to the 2, and then finally combine like terms. And our final answer is 32x squared plus 36x plus 7. For part b, we're going to do the same thing, except we're going to do g into f. So we're going to take 2x squared plus 5x, and we're going to put that in for the x in 4x plus 1. So you can see we've started there. And we're going to distribute the 4, and we have 8x squared plus 20x plus 1. 
Notice that f of g of x and g of f of x are not always equal. They can be, but that's a very special case. Now, how do we work this backwards? In other words, I've got a function that's been composed and I want to pull it apart into two separate functions that when put together give me that result. Well, if you look at this, um, you'll notice that in h of x we've got 5x or we've got x squared minus 5, excuse me, uh, in there twice. That's a really big hint. That would be a really great candidate for one of our two functions, for our inside function, in fact. So we're going to let g of x be x squared minus 5. Now, what happens to x squared minus 5? Well, it gets cubed and it gets multiplied by 4. So our outer function is going to be x cubed minus 4x and then plus 3. And that gives us the two functions that when we put them together, as f of g of x gives us what h of x is. All right, let's try an application problem. It says, suppose that a businesswoman invests $1,500 as her fixed cost in a new venture that produces and sells a device for satellite radio. Each device costs $100 to manufacture. We're going to write a cost function for the product if x represents the number of devices produced and we're going to assume that it's linear. We're then going to find the revenue function if each part, um, each device in part A sells for, sells for $125. We're then going to give the profit function, and remember profit is revenue minus cost, and then part D, how many items must be produced and sold before the company makes a profit? All right, give yourself a challenge. See if you can do this, pause the recording, resume the recording to check your answer. So we know that each device costs $100, plus there was $1,500 um, base amount in there, so 100X plus $1,500. They're being sold for $125 each, so revenue is 125X. The profit, we're going to subtract those two, revenue minus cost. So we'll get 25x minus 1,500. And we want a profit greater than zero. So we will solve this and get that x is greater than 60. Now, normally in, in a non-real world situation, you know, that could be 60.0001. But we're talking about selling items. So she must sell at least 61 items to begin making a profit. Now let's try another problem. The formula for the surface area S of a sphere is 4 pi r squared, where r is the radius of the sphere. You're going to construct a model that describes the amount of surface area gained when r is increased by 2 inches. And then we're going to determine the amount of extra material needed to manufacture a ball of radius 22 inches compared to a ball of radius 20 inches. Pause this recording and give it a try. Resume the recording to check your answer. Okay, so all we need to do for part A is in place of R, put R plus 2. So we have uh, D of R equals 4 pi R plus 2 squared. And then minus 4 pi R squared because it actually asks us to describe the amount of surface area gained when R is increased by 2 inches. So if we just had the 4 pi times r plus 2 squared, that would tell us the new surface area. What we want to know is how much more is there now. So we're going to subtract the original surface area amount. And then what we're going to do is take that formula and we are going to put in the original surface area, which is 20. Uh, the 2 is already accounted for in the problem. So just put in 20 and we get about 1,056 extra square inches. All right, now we have a few classwork problems. Give these a try, pause the recordings to do them, and then resume the recording to check your answer. Proceed like this until the end of the video.